summer um, so we've got uh, western bean cutworm here this is my pointer this is what the adult moth looks like you can see they're kind of mostly brownish reddish brown in color but they have this beige band on the leading edge of the forewing and then a little circular spot and a half moon spot on each wing so those are the adults that you would catch in the fair so these traps. are some of the older instars of western bean cutworm. When they first hatch from the eggs, they're really only a couple millimeters long, but this would probably be uh, about a fourth instar and a fifth instar, and then the sixth instar, which is the, is the last instar before they're gonna crawl out of the ears and go down into the soil uh, to spend the winter as a pre-pupa and then a pupa next spring. But you can ID the uh, younger, well, the easiest one to ID is the, the, big, the big sixth instar larva, right? Because behind the head, they have these two really dark, obvious little blocks or dark bands there. Hopefully that was, you can see that. Um, their head is kind of an orangey brown uh, color, but those, those dark bands are really the key to identify them. On the uh, slightly younger instars, you can see those bands are there, but they're not as dark. They darken as the instars get, or as they get into older instars. But on the body, you'll notice there really aren't any obvious um, stripes. There's a little bit of striping there, but m mostly it's just kind of this like diamond shaped pattern along their dorsal side. Um, but really no um, big spots or stripes that are too prominent. If we compare that to corn earworm, which is another one that you often find in the field or in the ears at this time, they're kind of similar looking to Western bean cutworm, but you'll see the the head is is always kind of orange in color, and we've got one who's not not died here yet, and um, uh, and the, those dark bands behind the head are not there. Like I know this guy does have a dark pro prothoracic shield, but um, those, the bands are different from the western bean. You can see that split between the two of them. And also corn earworm have stripes all along the body and they come in all different colors. Sometimes you see that some that are really bright yellow or bright green. Some are pink looking, some are really dark like this guy kind of uh, with some black coloration. But you'll notice they also have all of these little black uh, spots along their abdominal segments, which we call tubercles. They're like little warts that have hairs sticking out of them if you look really closely. And so the western bean cutworm don't have that. Every caterpillar has some, you will see some little spots along their segments, and those are the spiracles, with the holes that they breathe through. Mm. Um, but these are just spiracles on a western bean cutworm. These are actual tubercles on the uh, corn earworm above the spiracles. And this is what the corn earworm moth looks like if you're trapping for those. They're just kind of a beige colored moth. Um, these two little dark spots are pretty distinctive on them. And then lastly here we have European corn borer. Uh, this is what the adults look like. This is a female moth and this is a male. The female is more of a tan color, kind of like the earworm color. And the male is a little bit more dark brown or a little darker brown. And the, the uh, corn borer larvae, um, are pretty much just kind of beige colored body and a black head. That's about it with them. There's, there are little, um, there's kind of little halo marks on every abdominal segment, but that's quite hard to see. So like a little black circle that's pale in the center. If you got under the microscope, you could see that better. Um, but these guys you would find now in, in, in the, the beginning of September, Probably if you split a corn stalk open where you have those little entry holes with the sawdust and the, the frass coming out, um, you would probably find one of these guys crawling around in there. So these, these are sometimes in the ears, but more often in the corn stalk or in the shank of the stalk, but sometimes in the ears. The western bean cutworm and the corn earworm would be the most uh, common ones that you would find in the and ears. And so in terms right of the damage that these caterpillars cause, as I said, you know, the, mostly the ear feeding is western bean cutworm and corn earworm. And their feeding is very similar. Um, they usually come into the ear through the silk channel 
when they're little, smaller instars, and feed on the silks, and then start to feed on the, the tip kernels. Um, as they get bigger, they may move down lower on the ear or do more feeding damage. Western bean cutworms sometimes will, uh, at some point, move out of the ear into a neighboring plant, move ear to ear, so you'll see entry holes on the side of the husk, probably from those guys. Um, but with western bean cutworm, in Ontario especially, um, because they do move around so much and uh, make such a mess of the ear, we think they're more of a culprit for uh, allowing more pathogens to get into the ear, which cause uh, ear molds like Fusarium or Gibberella, and then maybe more mycotoxins in the grain. Corn earworm is very similar, similar type of feeding damage, um, but they tend to stay usually more near the tip of the ear throughout their life cycle. And just at the end, when they're when they're big big guys almost ready to pupate, they'll crawl down towards the bottom of the ear and create one exit hole. Um, and the European corn borer, as I mentioned, they're mostly in the stalks, um, feeding on the vasculature of the plant, so that's interrupting things and causing stalk weakening and and um, also those holes that they they bore in and out of the stalk are entry points for for stalk rots and things. Um, and, in, and on the ear, not, not so much kernel feeding usually, but they may, might be more apt to feed on the cob of the ear below the kernels or up through the shank into the center of the ear. So can, can you talk a little bit about uh, what producers should be asking their uh, corn seed reps about what BT proteins they should be using or what, what's available to them. Yep, yep, definitely. I think uh, there's a couple resources too that the growers could use in addition to their reps. They might want to check out the corn, Canadian Corn Pest Coalition's website, which mm -hmm. is www.cornpest.ca. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there is a trait table on there, which tells all the different companies' trait packages, yes. which, which cry proteins are, are uh, produced by those plants and which pests they control. Mm -hmm. And so to try and kind of quickly summarize it, um, you know, uh, Western bean cutworm, for example, uh, we know that they are resistant to cry 1F. Mm -hmm. They were never susceptible to cry 1AD. Right. And the other two traits that are in uh, SmartSax products, which are cry 1A.105 and cry 2AD2. Mm -hmm. So the only, the only uh, cry protein that protects for Western bean cutworm is the BIP. A right. protein, yeah. and that's actually the same case with corn earworm. Okay. So that's the only uh, the only BT products that will control those two pests would be something that produces the VIP protein. Right. Um, so that kind of covers earworm and western bean cutworm, yep. and then in terms for of European corn borer. Yes. Uh, you know, in in almost everywhere else in North America, <laughs> they are susceptible to cry one AD, cry one yep. F. Cry 1A.105 and Cry 2A B2. They mm -hmm. are not susceptible to VIP 3A, right. which is different okay. from the, the earworm and the western bean cutworm. But we now know that in Nova Scotia, we have a problem with uh, European corn borer that have developed resistance to Cry 1F. Mm -hmm. So um, what there are no longer uh, BT hybrids available that only produce Cry 1F. Right. They're usually pyramided with another, another uh, Cry protein like Cry 1AB. Mm -hmm. But that's a little risky now when you know you have resistance to the one right. protein that's in that plant already and now you're just relying on one more. Yes. So we're increasing the selection pressure against Cry1AB, which is, is risky in the long run. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say it's going to probably be a better strategy long term to go with a something that also has a pyramid containing Cry1A.105 and Cry2AB2. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that would probably be our best bet for now. And in terms of also prolonging the life of these traits yes. in, in this area where there's starting to be a little bit of resistance, the refuge is going to be really important. So I know it's it's in the bag for most growers mm -hmm. and it's it's a, it's implemented for you. You don't have to really think about it, but think about also non-BT corn right. as a refuge that yes. can keep susceptible populations going in some cases. Maybe if you, if you don't think you're at risk of mm -hmm. any of those corn pests, maybe use a non-BT hybrid for for a little while. Yeah, we kind of integrate that know, into the system. Yeah, we've kind of steered clear, I guess, of uh, that some of the non-BT ones for yeah. quite a while, just because the BT stuff was so effective. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessary all the time, right? If, if you don't That's have right. the pressure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, we, we don't anticipate that the cry one F resistance will ever go away mm -hmm. in the population, unfortunately, but hopefully if we have more susceptibles out there, it would at least dilute it a little bit. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so some years we have uh, a lot more corn insect pressure than others. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, there a good reason for that? Or uh, yeah. how is there a way to kind of predict what it, the season is going to be like? Right. It's, it's, we don't have any really great predicted, no. predictive <laughs> models for any of them. We have degree day models, which mm -hmm. we can use to determine when their development is happening and when the flights would start or yeah. uh, of the moss and then using your pheromone traps to, to track that a bit or, mm -hmm. you know, confirm that that is what's happening and that, that tells you when you should scout fields for egg masses mm -hmm. in the case of Western bean cutworm. Um, but uh, predicting year to year is really a total crapshoot with these pests right now. We don't have right. great um, information on what, what impacts their populations over right. winter and things. Um, we think western bean cutworm, it might be overwintering in this region now. It's mm -hmm. been confirmed to overwinter in Ontario and Quebec, so yep. possibly they're overwintering here too, so you have some resident populations, but yep. in addition, you probably have some migratory populations right. coming from the, the east and the south. Yep. Um, even we do in Ontario, we think we get some from the US. Okay. So yeah. that's still all happening. So um, a good way to monitor that is through the Great Lakes and Maritimes Pest monitoring network yes. <laughs> which you can find online through field crop news from omafra yep. and i'm sure you guys have a link to it too on your yep, site absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah but so those those um that website tracks the flights of all of these corn pests that we're talking yep. about western wing cutworm corn earworm mm -hmm. black cutworm fall armyworm um, we're collaborating across the kind of the you know ontario quebec and the maritimes as well as some of our neighboring states to the south and mm -hmm. so for some of those migratory populations that don't overwinter in Canada, like uh, corn earworm or fall armyworm, yeah. we can track when they're coming up the states and into our region that way. And yeah. So you can look at those, and the, the trap counts are reported on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and you can kind of see when things are starting to peak. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great tool for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. and, um, we've got that on linked on our website on the corn page, and uh, and often through crop links as well. Great, so. that's good. All right, so we know that uh, we have CRY1F resistance for ECB populations here in Nova Scotia, and uh, in Ontario you have multiple protein resistance for corn earworm. Uh, yeah, and corn rootworm. And corn rootworm, yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. that's what I yeah. corn rootworm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how concerned would sh should we be about um, developing resistance to other proteins for the various corn pests? Yeah. And kind of what can we do to mitigate that right yeah our biggest issue probably in Ontario right now is corn rootworm resistance yeah. developing to all of the different uh, rootworm proteins that mm -hmm. are out there and you know it's happening in only really what drives it is continuous use like continuous corn production and then continuous use of the same traits right. over and over for yeah. a number of years um, and so livestock producers are usually kind of in that boat where they're the ones who need continuous corn mm -hmm. production and so it, that's where we're seeing it happen yeah. in Ontario so I would say here you know try to try not to grow continuous corn yeah. I mean crop rotation is the easiest way to control rootworm sure. if there isn't corn planted in the field the following year that you had corn there and they were there laying their eggs then they'll die yeah. but if you put corn in there then that'll support the larva that hatch out and they'll develop and, mm -hmm. and lay more and you know the beetles come out and lay more eggs and the cycle continues right. And those, those BT traits for corn rootworm are not, they've never been a silver bullet. They've never right. been like a 100% control. Yeah. So we've always had some survival happening and, and just probably lo using the traits for too long has, yeah. what's, has been what's driven it. So rotation is the number one, but also, you know, if you scout fields in August <laughs> um, for the beetles, like if you're gonna grow corn after corn, yeah. if you scout your field late in August and you see um, just around the ear zone, uh, an average within 100 plants of say one western corn rootworm per yep. plant or two northern corn rootworm per, per yep. plant, then you would want to probably have some way of controlling right. the next year. So that's the threshold. But if it's lower than that, you can probably get away without using a BT hybrid for, uh, for another year. So you might yep. be able to use a soil insecticide or um, my, I just blanked, the soil insecticide. We don't have the high rate in Unix anymore. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, you might be able to extend the life of, of the, the traits by not yes. using them to maybe the third or fourth year right. and then rotating out of corn. But we don't want to see people using those traits for more than three, four max right. years in a row. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're in a good position here in Nova Scotia where we don't have the highest high populations of right. corn rootworm yet. Um, but also the resistance, so we can we can start doing some of these things now yeah. to hopefully yes. hold it off even exactly. longer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're in a great position in that way, and, and we've just been uh, our rootworm populations have always been a challenge to yeah. manage if you're growing continuous corn, and then you know we just thought that the traits were so good, I guess they just got used a little more than we should have. Yeah. So. We're not <laughs>